Welcome to Avalon Church. We're so glad that you are here. I know that many of you are joining us online, and we've said it uh, time and again. We are one church in many locations, but slowly but surely, people are starting to come back and meet live with us. It's just great to see your face. Everybody looks so wonderful, and I cannot wait to see your face, those of you that are joining us online as well. And so, happy Mother's Day to you. So glad that you're here today. And in honor of Mother's Day, and in light of the series that we're in about questions, I want to talk to you for just a couple of minutes about the questions that moms ask. Have you ever noticed, moms, that you used to be sane until you had kids? You used to be normal. You used to be cool until you had kids. And, of course, having kids drives you out of your ever-loving mind, right? My mom told me that, and I believe it. Uh, here are some questions that probably only moms would understand. Here's the first one. Who put the Legos in the refrigerator? Uh, that's a great question. Or the frog, or whatever, right? Or um, the second one is, what part of no do you not understand? Let's be honest. How many moms have asked that? What part of no don't you understand? I get it. I've asked my kids that as well. And this one, I, I don't know that there is an answer to this question, but how many times do I have to tell you? Uh, if the kid doesn't know, then I don't know if you know. And then here's one that moms of boys probably ask. Why is your underwear on your head? Isn't that crazy? I mean, little boys, they do the craziest thing. And here's one that I wish somebody would ask me right now. Do you need a timeout? Now, when I was a kid, I didn't get timeouts. I got knockouts. You know, if you didn't do what you said, the dad said or whatever, you wouldn't get a timeout. You'd get a knockout. But I wish somebody would ask me that now because I'd be like, yes. Let me go home and take a nap, right? How many love naps as an adult? Let me see your hand. Those of you online, I can't see your hand, but I'm assuming that you're like everybody here in the audience, that you love naps as well. Here's another one. Do you think money grows on trees? That's a great question, isn't it? Um, and then this is one that I thought my mom should always have known the answer to, even though she asked me this many, many times. Were you born in a barn? Now, I'm like, Mom, maybe you should know the answer to that. You were there, all right? You would know where I was born. And then my, fa well, my next favorite one, are you going to wear that? Now, if you're dressed and they're getting ready to go out the door and Mom asks, are you going to wear that? It should be, the answer should be like, no, these are my getting ready to get dressed clothes that I'm going to wear Uh but then my last one, the favorite question that my mom used to ask me, you've asked your kids this, and no telling how many times my mom asked me this question, do you want a spanking? Now, consider how insane that question is. Of course they don't want a spanking. And if you were like me, that I was such a smart aleck, and I looked at my mom one time and it's like, um, you know, I've been thinking about that all day, and yes, I would like a spanking. She about lost her mind, all right? Now, in honor of our moms, because you have such a wonderful, uh, wonderful demeanor and a tough job to do, let's give all of our moms a hand. We appreciate you. Those of you at home, make sure you let the moms in your room, in your life, know how much you love them. Well, today we're talking about the question of eternity. We've been in this series for called questions and we all have questions that we want to ask God but did you know that the Bible is filled with questions that God actually asks us and these are some of the greatest questions ever now it's not that God doesn't know the answer to the question he wants us to think about our life and to come to grips and to grapple with something when he asks us a question so today we're going to talk about the question of eternity is there life after death? The Bible tells us in the writings of King Solomon, he wrote this. He said, God has put eternity in the human heart. I believe intrinsically because we're made in the image of God. Every person, even if they're an atheist, I mean, the fact is atheists often, you know, would, you know, most atheists, if they were honest, they would not say that they 
were definitively an atheist, but maybe they had questions. They were agnostic or whatever. That's a little more honest. But the fact is, even in a person like that that says, I struggle to believe in God, the fact is God has put that question in our heart. We desire something more. We believe intrinsically in our own heart. There is something more to this life than just this life itself. That's one of the great questions of life. Is there life after death? Well, today we're going to read a passage where God asks this question. And the, the setup is we're reading from the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was written by a prophet in the Old Testament named Ezekiel. And he lived during the time of the Babylonian captivity of the Israelites from Judah. That was the southern kingdom. They had been taken uh, captive by Babylon. And their temple had been destroyed and they were living in isolation. They were living as prisoners of war. And uh, they, they really had a lot of turmoil and, and a lot of loss in their life. And so Ezekiel is this prophet and he's bringing messages from God to the Israelites at this time. So we're going to pick up in Ezekiel chapter 37. And this is kind of a famous passage of scripture where God asks, can dry bones live? Now, it's important that you understand that what Ezekiel is describing here is a vision. He wasn't actually standing in a valley full of dry bones. He was having a vision from God, and I believe a very specific and very important vision. The Bible says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. For all of you horror film uh, enthusiasts, it sounds like the setting to a zombie movie, doesn't it? And he led me around among them, and behold, there were many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? Now I want you to get the implication of this question that God asks in this vision. Can these bones live? Is God capable of bringing dead things to life? Well, of course he is. Can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. The question is, can these dry bones live? Well, the fact is, this is a very important question. Does God have the ability to bring dead things to life? Does God have the ability to bring things that are not as if they are? Well, of course he does. That's the whole point of the gospel. Jesus did not come into the world to make you turn over a new leaf. Jesus did not come into the world to help you keep the Ten Commandments because even though you should try to keep the Ten Commandments, that's not the way to be made right with God. No, Jesus came in the world to bring dead things to life. Now, the, re the reason for this question and for this vision that Ezekiel had, there are two theological, very, very important reasons. The first was God had made a promise to Israel that a Messiah would come through their nation. He promised Abraham many, many years before that all the nations of the world would be blessed through him. And he's talking about the Messiah that we know as Jesus. And so at this time, because the Israelites didn't really have a country at the time, they were in Babylonian captivity, uh, God was telling them that in spite of your sin, I'm going to make dead things come back to life. You have a dead nation right now, and I'm bringing it back to life. The second reason that this was an important important question and an important vision was because this pictures God's salvation. Salvation for mankind. The fact that Jesus would come one day and offer salvation to us, this was the reason, this was a very, very important question. Can these dry bones live? So the question then becomes that we must grapple with is there life after death? 
And I realize that for many of you in the room and many of you watching online today, you've already settled this question. You believe there is life after death. You believe that uh, when you die, uh, you have given your life to Christ and you're going to meet God and you're going to be with Him in eternity. But I want you to think about this because the implications of this question are often more than what we realize or what we think about a lot of times, okay? So, is there life after death? Well, the Bible is pretty clear that um, there is life after death. Let me just give you a few examples. The first idea that we get that there's life after death is found in the book of Genesis, chapter 5. Listen to what it says. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Now, how many have heard of Methuselah before? You ever heard anybody say, you're as old as Methuselah? Methuselah, according to the book of Genesis, lived 969 years. That's old. <laughs> um, the fact is, I don't know what women lived. It didn't really record the, the women's age. But normally, women live a little longer on average than men. And so there were probably some women that lived to 1,000 years. Can you imagine that? I mean, can you imagine the conversations back then? Oh, I've got these wrinkles. Oh, honey, you hush. You don't look a day over 500 years old, right? I mean, that would be interesting, right? But Methuselah, he was the father of Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God. He fathered Methuselah 300 years, and uh, he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. That's the first picture we see of life after death. God took him. He translated him. I don't know how exactly that happened, but God took him from this life to the next. Here's another time we see the picture of life after death in the Old Testament. Uh, Elijah was an Old Testament prophet, and he was with Elisha, two different people, Elijah and Elisha. Elisha was his contemporary, but also his, uh, the person that succeeded him, his successor. And they were walking together, and notice how Elijah was taken out of here. He said, and as they went on and talked, behold, the chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Now, I can't think of a better way to go from this life to the next than on a chariot of fire with horses of fire. If God, please let me go that way, that would be awesome, right? You just hear, and then all of a sudden, boom, you're riding on horses of fire. Pretty awesome, right? Well, that pictures that there is life after death. Uh, there are many times throughout the Old Testament where life after death is talked about. Job. You've heard of the patience of Job. Well, Job is a real person. Some scholars believe he lived maybe before Moses did. And listen to what Job himself, this is before any of Scripture was written. He said, For I know that my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, in other words, after I die, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. He was convinced that there was the resurrection of the body, that there was life after death. Well, we could talk a lot more about this. Elijah raised a widow's son back to life. Elisha raised a little boy back to life. A man came back to life after being thrown on top of Elijah's bones in a grave. They were in a hurry. I'm not sure why you'd be such a hurry in a funeral. But they threw this guy's dead body on the bones of Elijah, and he resurrected. He got back up. Pretty incredible stuff, right? Incredible story. Well, we also see that Jesus raised a widow's son. He raised a synagogue official's daughter. And, of course, he raised his friend Lazarus back to life. Now, here's the thing. Christianity is built on the notion that there is life after death. Without the resurrection, without life after death, Christianity is utter nonsense. It's absolutely worthless and pointless. Listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote about that. He said, but tell me this, since we preach that Christ 
rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless. And your faith is useless. And we apostles then uh, would be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave, but that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are to be more pitied than anyone in the world. The entire plan of Christianity, the entire belief of Christianity is based on on the fact that there most definitely is life after death. And I would say the greatest authority on this of all would be Jesus Christ himself. Listen to what Jesus, not only did he raise from the dead, but listen to what he said right before he resurrected Lazarus, his friend, back from the dead. And Jesus told her, he was talking to Martha, Lazarus' sister. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who believes in me uh, or lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Well, he was not talking about physical death, but spiritual death so that we understand that there is life after death. That the moment you die, you enter into another realm. You enter into another dimension. You enter into another life. Is there life after death? Well, I want you to understand that there are some very important implications of this. And even if you've already settled it in your heart like I have, I believe, yes, there is life after death. But there are some very important things to think about that will affect the way I live if I keep this at the forefront of my mind. Here's the first implication. If there's life after death, this is the most important question ever. The most important question that can be asked. Is there life after death? Because if there is, it means that there's more to life than this life. Have you ever noticed how easy it is to get caught up in this life and we forget about the things that are most important? Oh, it's so easy to let family relationships go by the wayside. Friends relationships go by the wayside. It's so easy for us to forget that Christ and our relationship with our Heavenly Father should be the most important thing in our life. But we get busy living sometimes, don't we? We forget it. And one of the dangerous things about that is what Jesus said. You remember the story of Noah? Noah and Noah's ark. God destroyed the entire world with a worldwide flood because of the sinfulness of mankind. I want you to notice what Jesus said about that. He said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, when he would come back again. Here's what he said. They were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Now, have you ever stopped to dissect that? What is wrong with eating and drinking? you got to live, right? Anybody going to eat lunch today? Anybody going to eat something the rest of the day? Well, of course you are. The fact is, it's normal for us to eat and to drink. It's normal for us to live life, to have social interaction. I realize we're challenging a little bit right now with the social interaction part. But the fact is, it is completely normal for us to have that as a part of our life, as a part of our routine. Then he said they were marrying and giving in marriage. What does that mean? Well, that means that they were giving their children away to be married, just like we do today. Um, I've done a lot of weddings in my life, and I've never seen uh, an angry wedding. I've never seen an unhappy wedding. Now, I've seen some unhappy couples afterwards, but not during the wedding. And, you know, it's incredible. You know why? Because they're so joyful. They're so happy. You know why? Because marriage is a normal 
wonderful thing. Now here's the, the question. What's so bad about marrying or giving your children in marriage? What's so bad about eating and drinking so that you can live or have fellowship with people or interact with family and friends? Nothing. There's nothing remotely sinful about that. In fact, I would argue that it can bring glory to God in a great way in your life. But the problem was this. They had no room for God in their life. Oh, yeah, they were going about regular life, but they had no room for God in their life. Oh, not that they didn't believe in God, probably. It's just that they were, they were busy. And here's the thing. If there's life after death, it affects the way we live because there's more to this life than just this life. It means that I'm going to live somewhere forever. Now, I want you to think about this. The biblical definition of heaven is being in the presence of God forever. If you want to learn more about heaven, I've got a series of messages I did on heaven about a year and a half ago. You can go to our website and you can uh, listen to those messages. Let me tell you something. The opposite of heaven, the definition of hell, is eternal separation from God. Now, fire is used throughout Scripture to describe the judgment of God. And I really do believe that uh, hell is the separation from God and all of his attributes. Now, think about this. God is love. So in hell, there is no love. We can have even in a broken, sinful world because we have the image of God and the Holy Spirit is here drawing people to himself and to the Father. Uh, we are able to experience love. Even people that don't know Christ, they can experience love. But think about it, if there's no love, never a loving act, never kindness, never gentleness, goodness, meekness, self-control, patience, love, peace, none of it, never for a second. Think about the fact that God, if, if you are separated from God and his attributes, that means that there is no justice, there is no goodness. God's holy. There's not a single act of holiness. There's not a single act of doing what is right. There's nothing but wicked and evil. And I don't know about you, but that would describe torment for me. Here's the thing. If heaven is real, and I believe it is, and if there's life after death, then that is the most important question ever. I want you to see the second thing, that if there's life after death, it's the most personal question ever. I want you to see what Jesus said to Simon Peter. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? He was asking them who people thought he was. And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of of the living God. It's personal. You see, it's one thing for your mom to be a Christian or for your grandma to be a Christian. I've been in a lot of church buildings. In fact, it's funny, my wife kind of makes fun of me. Every time we go on a trip, anytime I go somewhere, I'm just like, oh, there's a church. Oh, there's a church. I see all these church buildings and stuff. Kind of my thing, I guess. And I've been in a lot of churches where they have the pews. Anybody been in an old Methodist church or an old Baptist church where they got the pews, the wooden pews, and they got little brass plates on the end of the pew, and it says, you know, donated by so-and-so? Let me tell you something. You can have a family that donated five pews down at the old local church and still not go to heaven. You see, it's not about what your grandma did. It's not about what your grandpa's relationship with Christ was like. It's personal. It's about your relationship with God. It's the most important question ever. It's the most personal question ever. I love what it says in Acts about this Philippian jailer. And it says, then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. I love that. The fact is, it's a personal question. What have you done with Jesus? What does your eternity look like? 
The fact is, you can be good, you can be as good as you can possibly be and not be right with God. Why? Not about your ability to be good, because you can't be perfect. So what we must have is an advocate, a go-between, and we have that in Jesus Christ. He gave his life for our sin. He paid for Richie Miller's sin. You ever, think, you ever make it personal like that? When Jesus died on the cross, you were on his mind. You ever think about that? He thought about every sin you've ever committed. Every wrong thought. Every bad word. Every unkind deed. Every lie. Every moment of lust. Every moment of, of unrighteous anger. Oh, we could go down the, the list. The fact is, you might be a really good person compared to so-and-so. But you can't be as good as Jesus. But thank God, because of that personal nature of the question, you can have the righteousness of Christ by faith. It's the most personal question ever. And then, and I love this, the last thought, and we're done. This is the most hopeful question ever. Is there life after death? Well, I believe there is. And because of that, I have hope. I've got several family members that are in heaven. I've got friends that are in heaven. You know, I can't wait to see Jesus, but you know, I'm kind of looking forward to seeing family members as well. I, I can't wait to see my grandpa and my grandma on both sides of my family. They're family members and friends that I cannot wait to hug their neck. It's the most hopeful question ever because not only will we see loved ones again if they were saved and we're saved, we'll get to see Jesus. I can't wait to see him. I cannot wait to be able to meet him in person for the first time. Oh, it's a hopeful thing. It offers hope for justice, for reward, for beauty. Did you know I, and I, I've been watching these videos. I like watching different questions and deep things. I don't understand many deep things, okay? A lot of it's way over my head, but I do like to watch it every once in a while. It makes me feel a little bit smart. And, uh, but I, I, recently I watched these scientists. These guys, all their PhDs, and man, they're incredible scientists. And they've been talking about how that they have discovered that beauty is not just subjective. You've heard it said, beauty's in the eye of the holder, right? Uh, there are some things that people look at and they say, boy, that's beautiful. And other people say, no. If you ever look at modern art, there's some people think that's incredible. I happen to be one of those people. Uh, I, I know how difficult that stuff is to do. But other people look at it and say, yeah, it looks my, like my dog walked through some paint and got his paws on the, the thing. But you know that they discovered that beauty is something that is the desire for beauty is innate in us. There's scientific reasons for it. And that it's not just in the eye of the beholder, but there is actual desire for beauty. You know what that tells me? That one day when we see God, there's going to be incredible, unimaginable, unending beauty. Wow. Wow. That's a reason for hope, isn't it? And then I want you to see that there's great hope and that we'll see Jesus and we'll see loved ones again. I've been a pastor now for 34 years, long time. Starting when I was 21 years old. For those of you that will get uh, a mental cramp if uh, I don't tell you how old I am because you're trying to do the, uh, the math, I'm 55 years old. I've heard of a lot of near-death experiences or deathbed experiences. I've experienced some of those with people that I've known. I won't tell you about many, but I'm gonna tell you about one. Several years ago, I was in the airport in Dallas, Texas. I'd been to a pastor's conference there, and I, in the airport, I was hanging out with some pastor friends. We were talking and laughing and having a good time, having a good time before we caught our flights to separate places. And, and a pastor friend of ours, all of us knew him, walked up and oh everybody was glad to see him we were talking and he had just come from a funeral from a pastor that he had known for many years 
this old pastor had just passed away and he was not a famous person he was not someone that everybody would know he wasn't on television but he was a very faithful man and some of his children happened to have struggled in their faith they happened to not all of them but some of them they were struggling with their faith is this real and and questions like that well the mom called all the children she said you've got to get to the hospital quick the doctor has told us he's not going to live much longer he had been in a coma for days, perhaps even weeks. The children got there and they gathered around the bed. Dad was getting ready to pass from this life to the next. They were holding hands and singing a song and praying over him. And all of a sudden, this old preacher, he just sat upright, bolt, bolted upright in his bed. And he had this incredible look on his face, this look of extreme joy this look of happiness this look of wonder and surprise and he began to he began to cry they thought he was just having an episode but this old preacher he looked at each of his children in the eyes he said kids I see him I can see him and I want you to know it's real it's so Real. He drew his last breath, laid down, went into the arms of Jesus. You know, there are a lot of reasons some people do what they do. Some people do what they do for money. Some people do what they do for prestige or promotion. You know why I do what I do? Do you know why? I stand on stage and I tell people about Jesus and I try to get people to follow Christ. You know why? There's only one reason. Because I believe. It's real. It's real. It is so, so real. Friend, I want to invite you into a very real relationship with a very real Savior. Because one day you're going to see Him and you're going to know that it's real. For those of you that are watching online and you want to receive Jesus, you want to enter into a real relationship with Christ, I invite you to pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And right now I'm asking you to save me, to forgive me, to change me, to live in me. And I'm asking you to be my Lord and Savior. If you'll pray a prayer like that, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I hope you'll click online there as you're watching that you prayed to receive Christ just now. Those of you that are live in the room here today, if you've never received Christ, I'm going to invite you to give your life to Him. He loves you more than you can imagine, and He is the most real thing that exists, I promise you. And He loves you. And maybe today you would pray to receive Christ and you fill out your next step card and drop it in one of the buckets on the way out today if you would. Maybe you have a next step that you need to take. Kelsea was talking earlier about our next step class online. You can actually take that today. In a few weeks, we are going to do one that is going to be live online. And man, it's going to be incredible. It's a great opportunity for you to join our church, to learn more about our church. If you haven't done that yet, I would encourage you to do that online. If you'd like to be baptized or you'd like someone to pray for you here in the service, fill out a next step card. If you're watching online, fill out one of those next step cards as well. But we want you to know that we love you today. And we're so very glad that you've joined us. Don't forget now that you can give at avalonchurch.net. You can give by texting to give, 84321. If you're live here today, you can give either in the buckets or you can give at the giving kiosk as well as these other ways. Or if you are uncomfortable with giving online, you can certainly mail it in to us as well. I want you to know that I love you. Happy Mother's Day to everyone. For those of you watching online, happy Mother's Day to all of those that are alive in our services today. I want you to know that I love you. I'm so very glad to see your face. Every week we're getting a few more people coming here live, and I cannot wait to see you again. God bless you. I love you.
Happy Mother's Day. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.